production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... The Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and its member company, Ewing Kessler Incorporated, providing mechanical and building control solutions for sustainable, energy-efficient building performance. This privately owned regional company is committed to relationships and service responsive to clients' needs. Learn more at ewingkessler.com and ekautomation.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The revitalization of the medical district tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Tommy Pacello, who's the president of the newly formed Medical District Collaborative. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Eric. Gary Shorb, CEO of Methodist Le Bonheur. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Ken Brown is executive vice chancellor of the UT Health Sciences Center. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. So we'll talk, uh, get all your perspective on your vision and, and why you're involved in this. I'm, but I'm going to start with you, Tommy, and we've got some maps that kind of define the area and define the, the area we're talking about. These two uh, gentlemen represent a couple of the institutions involved, but a whole lot of prominent institutions in the area are involved in this collaborative. So let's, let's define the area, and then we'll get into the vision and the changes and some of the problems you hope to address. So talk about the institutions involved. Let's start with Sure, absolutely. With the, the, the area generally runs from about Cleveland to Danny Thomas and Vance, approximately North Parkway, but it also includes an area around the Pinch District to, to bring in St. Jude. And within that area, it's about two and a half square miles, there are eight major institutions that are involved in this effort. So in addition to uh, Methodist and uh, University of Tennessee, there's also Regional One Healthcare, there's Baptist College of, uh, of Health Sciences, there is St. Jude and ALSAC, um, uh, BioWorks, Southwest Tennessee Community College, Southern College of, Southern Optometry. College of Optometry, yeah. and, and they make up about 16,000 employees and about 8,000 students and collectively represent about a $2.7 billion operating budget within the district. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. That you, when you, I drive through there every day, I work downtown, right. I live in Midtown, and you, you, you don't think about it because, in part, the area is with some exceptions, it's not the most attractive area in Memphis, you know, and, and that is part of, it's more than attractiveness, but that's part of what you're after, right? Because people don't really live there, there are only a handful of restaurants there, and yet you've got all these employees and, and students. So talk a little bit about how you became involved yeah. and, and so on. You're right, right. And, and, and I think that, that what we see this, this even more so now, because as, as downtown Memphis has gone on this upward trajectory, and Midtown has, has been waking up with Overton Square and Crosstown and all the neighborhoods beginning to, to click on all cylinders, really, with you know, Broad Avenue, and Cooper Young, et cetera, the medical district, which had been primarily a, a place that people drove through, and unless you were working there or uh, had a, a reason to be there, uh, you, didn't, you weren't exposed to all the, the really great stuff that was happening within the campuses themselves. So the idea behind this work is how do we turn this pass-through area into this really vital linchpin that connects the downtown and midtown. And the campuses, uh, the medical the institutions that are there have done a remarkable job on the campuses. So now the effort is to say how do we leverage that investment and bring it in to, to fill in the gaps between the campuses. And, and Ken Brown, we were talking a little bit before the show about how you got involved and I think what you told me is that you all were doing your master plan and had some public meetings and pick up the story from there. Yeah, we were doing our master plan uh, which which was long overdue for the University of Tennessee uh, but to our surprise in some of our public forums, Region 1 was doing their master plan. You know, Gary and the work at Methodist and Le Bonner, they stay in a, a planning phase if you will and so for the institutions to have the opportunity to collaborate and, and you know, we all uh, move to a level of transparency where, you know, I share my master plan with Gary and Mary at Le Bonner and Dr. Coopwood at Region 1. And it was really interesting because they kind of shared their master plans, you know, and so we realized that our visions really were um, almost in sync as, as it relates to the medical district. The timing of it was remarkable because about the same time, uh, Pitt Hyde and the Hyde Foundation were bringing, were looking at revitalization of the medical district and we were very, very fortunate to get 
uh, a group U3 that was brought in by the Hyde Foundation to really bring those conversations together. And you work for U3 as well as being president or you're an advisor. It, or, what, a what, bit what, of a transitional period. A transitional now, period. But okay. have been working with U3 as a special project manager focusing exclusively on, on the Memphis And U3 project. was involved with transformations, revitalizations in Philadelphia, Detroit. Is that correct? Right, so correct. There's some so, precedent for this sort of thing. And, and they really are, they're, a, they're a real estate advisory company that specializes on institutional real estate strategies. And within that is uh, an effort to think about how do you leverage uh, uh, the anchor institutions to build communities back around them. And that was exhibited, as you mentioned, in West Philadelphia, around Penn, uh, around the Penn Hospital System, and around Drexel, right. uh, with a group called the University City Development Corporation. And then again, and most recently, in Detroit, with Midtown Detroit, Inc., yeah. look at working with Henry Ford Hospital, Detroit Medical Center, and Wayne okay. State. And remarkable results in both of those situations, doing exactly that same type of an effort that we're applying here. Right. Gary, you all got involved. You were surprised, happy to get involved. Get, tell me how, how Methodist of Honor got involved. Yeah, we were delighted to get involved. Um, we, uh, as Ken said, we've uh, had master plans for our various campuses. Um, Le Bonner, obviously, is a $350 million investment. We're getting ready to make a $300 million investment in a university hospital. So the more vibrant we can make the medical center, the better off we're going to be with those investments. And uh, we had had a working group uh, for some years, trying to work on things like security and, you know, Ken's really led the charge on that, parking and some other issues around making the medical right. center greener. But we didn't have a template or a plan, anything that would compare with what U3 brought to the table with their Detroit and Philadelphia experience. So, I mean, we were delighted the Hyde Foundation made the investment and uh, now we're making our own investments. Is it. there an angle at which it's also <clears throat> sort of a business investment? I mean, I know Mesut Bonner is a nonprofit, but you have a, a bottom line, you have a budget to make and so on that you're, you're trying to recruit. I mean, right. you're trying to recruit Ken students and students from other, you know, new employees from other places. Is that part of, I mean, if anyone has ever been in the, the new, <clears throat> excuse me, Le Bonner Hospital, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. it's an amazing place and amazing people. You step outside, it's iffy, you yeah. know? And yeah. is that part of it, just from a pure business point of view of recruitment and retention, that you felt like you needed to improve the area around it? Oh, definitely, absolutely. We want people to feel safe when they come into the medical center. We want them to feel like they are part of a vibrant, diverse, sustainable uh, part of our city and, you know, this plan will create that, which is great. But the, the talent issue is also huge. It'd be wonderful to have more of our employees, and we've got about 6,000 living in the medical, or working in the medical center, uh, living there too, yeah. and uh, working there, playing there. Uh, yeah, we'll put a map up that shows some where that, that difference, you know the numbers, Tommy, in terms of, of, you may have already said it, but it's something like only 2% of the people who work in the medical district live in that area. Well, it, uh, right, about about 3% of the employees of, of these institutions collectively live in, in the district, and about 6% of the students live in the district. But the interesting thing is that when you actually look at the maps and see where they're living, they're choosing to live very close by. So they're living in downtown, they're living in midtown. And the quality, the housing that's in the district today, that housing that is, uh, you know, where, where a student and, and the employees may want to live, is at 98% occupancy. So you have a really high occupancy rate in the district. So we actually have a bit of a supply issue of quality housing. Right. That, that's something that we can work on uh, w relatively quickly to help provide. All right, Bill. And, and that's kind of the question that I want to start with is in, in assembling this plan, you're looking at the land available that you've got and you're looking for investors to do things like housing and retail and and something other than than the current uses. Mm -hmm. What kind of a potential or what kind of an inventory is there within the district for those opportunities? Right, um, it, it's a good question. And, and, and the, anytime you're doing urban infill development, the putting the, the land assembly can be uh, somewhat challenging. But one thing that we think is a, is a great, uh, we, we look at as a huge potential for the district is the fact that with, we have about 110 acres of surface and va surface parking lots or vacant land that are actually owned by the institutions. And those create opportunities to then create, to, to, to develop partnerships between the institutions, private sector developers to, uh, to, to see this uh, development take place. Mm -hmm. For the University of Tennessee, Ken, uh, uh, describe for me kind of what you're looking for in terms of your students and your employees in, in the area where the University of Tennessee is currently. Right. Yeah, you know, to I want to pick up on a point that Gary made. You know, we um, 
probably in the midst of $350 million of capital construction over the last three or five years. You know, that's a huge investment, um, mm -hmm. you know, on the behalf of the state. Long overdue, but, but nonetheless a huge investment. We've got 3,500 students roughly uh, every year. We've got roughly 3,500 employees. We've got joint practice plan ventures with Gary and Region 1. So 100% of the physicians in Region 1, 100% of the physicians in Le Bonheur are University of Tennessee faculty affiliates. Uh, so we recruit residents nationally. The competition to recruit these people into this environment is extremely intense. So we're recruiting and competing with our competitors nationally to get, you know, really, really high-end people. And for most people, it isn't about how much money you pay them. It's about the environment that they have to live in. And, you know, when people come into the medical district, our students, and, and we, even though our students have been to undergraduate institutions, most of them, they're coming to professional school now. They're, they still have moms and dads who still want to know, where is he going to live? Where is he going to stay? Mm -hmm. And it's a horrible answer for me to give. I don't really know, you know, he can he moved down on Mud Island, there, there are plenty of places around. But if we had that capacity in the medical district, residential capacity, we have no doubt our students would stay on campus. You know, that district is among the safest places um, in Memphis. You know, we report our crime statistics to the Clery mm -hmm. Report. Our crime on campus is, is almost a virtual nil. And so having a residential community, and we've done probably six, eight million dollars worth of demolition, old buildings that have been offline for, you know, eight, ten years. Mm -hmm. So we've got the land capacity for a developer to come in, uh, work out the terms of a land lease with us as a state entity to build those residential communities for our faculty, our staff, our students, the basic scientists that we recruit, the physicians that we jointly recruit into Region 1 and, and Methodist Lamar. And, and, and Gary, from, from your standpoint at, at Methodist, um, what does this planning add? I mean, you've already got very ambitious plans that you've already outlined for, for, for the campus. Um, are there those kind of opportunities like, like Ken talked about to look at what you've done and maybe change some things in, in that regard? Yeah, there are. Just uh, using the parking example Tommy highlighted, um, we've got about four acres of surface parking near our professional building uh, just off of Union Avenue. We're building a 700-car parking garage with this new, uh, new hospital complex. Uh, you know, one thought is we get those cars off of that surface lot into the parking garage, and then we can use that four acres to have another Bristol apartment building that's right mm -hmm. there on Union, and that's 100% occupied right now. So the demand is there. If we can just create the various residential opportunities, it's going to be, uh, we're, we're going to have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And I think we're doing the same strategy as a part of this conjoined effort, you know, taking some surface lot space, old buildings that have been offline, you know, between Madison and Jefferson, you know, we've got literally a city block that, you know, in the next three years can be completely, the existing structure is completely demolished and the flat lot parking used to build some residential complex. And, and we've seen so much construction in, in that historic medical center area that I, w I would imagine that, that the temptation is so great and the momentum so great for all the institutions to keep on making their plans and doing what they've been doing for for decades now until someone finally said wait a minute there's an opportunity to take a a, a more total look at this yeah well the parking thing is a very interesting piece of the equation because we all have our separate and independent parking strategies and mm -hmm. you know if you look at the Bonner region when in the university we have all have a lot of parking in the medical district, but you know it isn't convenient parking where the parking lot is most convenient for us to use. It may be misplaced uh, at some distant point, and so you have people walking to from from distances, great distances in some cases, from their parking to where they work at, only because the property that their entity happens to own is a is a great distance away. And so, just having a conjoined parking strategy for how we're going to manage parking collectively in the medical district, it would be huge. Well, you uh, talked, Gary, in an article we did about the collaborative, and I don't want to pin this on you, but I'll, uh, you, you were very honest, and it was an interesting quote about, as an anchor, we've been buying properties for years as a way to target blight, but we are unintentionally dragging down property values. Talk a little bit about that. Anybody who knows Methodist, Lamont, or knows your work, 
knows that that's not your that's not your style. Um, you're a very civic minded person, but you unintentionally kind of contributed the blight. I thought talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, we because we haven't had a plan. Yeah. Uh, it it's been more of a defensive strategy when problem properties come on a tax sale, we'll go and we'll buy them for yeah. a few thousand dollars. And unfortunately, the condition of the housing would warrant just a teardown yeah. uh, strategy. So that is not helping anything yeah. in terms of yeah. building more capacity for housing in the, in, the, uh, in the medical district. So we needed a plan. <clears throat> and it, back to Ken's point, it was just so opportunistic that we have U3 who's done this and two other right. cities come and say, look, we know how to put this together, yeah. and we can help you. And, and to be clear, for anyone who's listening, or it, it, Methodist is not getting into the residential apartment no, business, no. I assume. Again, it was, no, 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 <laughs> Just so that's, we, we do not want to do that. We, uh, yeah, and nor we, does the universe. Yeah, and, nor does, <laughs> and, you're, you're, and, and to your point, you're not going to be putting um, uh, you know, skilled physician surgeons into dorms. We're no, not talking about that. So not. talk a little bit about the partnerships and how you get housing done when you've got land, but you obviously don't want to build apartment complexes. Yeah, well, I mean, part of the uh, challenge is you've got to put together uh, quantity of land in order to attract developers. Right. And that's where we're looking for Tommy and U3 to really start prioritizing where are those opportunities the most likely to occur, yeah. what's it going to take, and then we'll just phase it as, uh, as yeah. we go along. You want to address that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. One of the things that we've seen, and whether you're talking about Philadelphia, whether you're talking about Detroit, is you have to have that, that backbone organization. The backbone organization then connects the dots between these opportunities that are present with the anchor institutions and then, uh, and then develops the strategies on how to fill them back in. So the, to, to Ken's point about the parking strategy, to, to Gary's point about this vacant land, one of the things that the organization is able to do is then to begin to sort of package those items together and think about you know, how do we work to create that additional supply and work and part, build, we'll, we, we can build the partnerships with the private sector developers. How do we then also help to increase demand uh, in the district? One of the things that we, we're, we're looking at is um, and that was worked very successfully in Detroit is uh, you know employee incentives to live closer to the district. How does that work? Um, well, in Detroit, uh, a fund was raised and the uh, by the uh, the employers uh, and as well as by philanthropy, and the employees of the district were offered incentives to either buy a house in the district to move in or to to lease in the district. And uh, we're exploring what some things like might look like in, right. uh, in Memphis and how it applies here. It's not a direct comparison. Detroit had a lot more vacancy sure. than, than we have, and our issue is more of a supply issue. But it's, it's an example of how you can take uh, really an input into the, the anchor organizations through their employees, through their real estate, through the dollars that they're spending, and, and refocus them a little bit more so that you can increase both the demand while you're planning for the right. supply. We talk about incentives, and someone watching the show will be saying, well, they're going to come, they're, they're going to want money from the city and the county, and they're going to want tax incentives and so on. What, 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 good thing or bad? There's somebody watching who's going to think that, you know, has questions about that. Is that part of this? Is, are there tax incentives or, to get people to come in and build and so on? Uh, not, not by our organization. Now, okay. the, the Downtown Memphis Commission and others, they, they exist to, and one of the reasons okay. things that they are able to provide are these types of tax incentives and pilots and, and, and so forth and so on. Our budget and our organization is made up by these guys, yeah, right, by the institutions as well as by philanthropy okay. coming together. Okay, Bill. But infrastructure, which is the publicly financed part of this, the streets and roads and the and the transit systems, seem to be inherently a part of this as you change the way that people get around. You change where they park. You sure. change the distance that that they have to walk here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and the benefit of the city's investment or the county's investment in that infrastructure is now your tax base is a completely different mm -hmm. tax base than what it is right now yeah. in, in terms of right. you know, people living in the district. And we, will we, you we, all we, invest, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but will you all invest, I think I saw in an article that, you know, literally streetscapes and signage. Is there any part of you that is a little frustrated that the city or county just doesn't do it, that you all have to take that on? Or is that just, that's just the world we live in now? You want, well... I think that, that part of what we have to do in this district to, 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 to increase the opportunity for investment is we have to be brilliant on the basics, right? So we have to make sure that a district that has seen disinvestment over the past several years, not talking about the campuses, but the spaces right. between the campuses, 
uh, has a, that same level of care and looks like the district, so right. people will not be investing. Uh, now, I think that what we'll be doing is you'll see partnerships with the city. So yes. making sure that, you know, there are nine major infrastructure projects planned in the district uh, that will either start to be designed or start to be implemented in the next three years. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, you know, this work is a public-private partnership. The city puts in the public, the public infrastructure, and then the private sector builds up to it. And there's a, for years, if you do it in the right way, there's a high return on investment for both parties in doing it that way. And, you know, just a quick answer. I, you know, I don't really find myself frustrated that the city, you know, really doesn't have the resources to, to invest in everything. You know, they, they have a huge responsibility. It's like uh, the park, um, Health Sciences Park, in, in the nucleus of our campus. You know, we have a lease with the city for that park. We maintain it, we cut the grass, we, we keep it up. The city has lots of parks, and I'm sure they'd like to maintain them all at the same level. The fact that they've got a finite amount of resources to be able to do that doesn't negate my responsibility to maintain that park in the nucleus of my campus. And so we were very, very happy that the city was, the city was willing to lease us the park so yeah. that we could maintain it. So it, it is a partnership. Yeah, I mean, and, we've and got that same attitude, too. Eric, I mean, we're, we're ready to take over by Le bon or one of the other public parks. Yeah. We've got to work through the process with the city, but they've uh, kind of set the stage for that. As well as we know, um, with what we want to do, an improvement in the overall look of the medical center, we'll have to make some investments in mm -hmm. trash cans and benches and other right. uh, amenities, if you will, to yeah. really class it up. Right. And, and we're ready to do that. Just uh, five minutes left. St. Jude um, came out in late last year in a massive investment that they're yeah. putting in. Mm -hmm. you, you, how does that impact this? I, I, I assume for the better. But how is that the level of investment they're putting in, which everyone had kind of heard that there was going to be investment but it was, I think, more than people even expected. Right, right. Well, how did, did that change things or just accelerate this? Or well, I think it, it certainly helps to make the case for the need for additional yeah. uh, residential um, right. uh, development in the area. Uh, you know, it's one of the most... Uh, meaningful economic development uh, announcements yeah. that have come out in a long time. 2,000 additional employees uh, being hired in short order, yeah. and they're going to need a place to live. And right. they're coming in from, in many cases, from outside of Memphis. Right. And, and a quick thing, the Pinch District, is mm -hmm. it, that's been so beat up. I mean, the, the, the mothballing of the pyramid, uh, focus in other areas of downtown. What role do you all play? I, I guess I'll start with you, with the Pinch District, if any. Um, well, so so our area, and if you if you see the maps, what you'll notice is it extends uh, around the Pinch District up yeah. to Front Street, so that we have a good buffer around around St. Jude and, right. and what they're doing. And what we're seeing is that as St. Jude is going to be expanding and uh, in, in, uh, beyond their current campus boundaries, yeah. that that will begin to trigger. So we we think uh, quite a bit of right. development in the Pinch District. And you know, recently there's been some uh, some some studies that have been done in the Pinch District, and about a, a new planning effort may soon be underway there okay. uh, with the D DMC, and we're engaged in all of those conversations the table and how, with that and absolutely so, yeah. and, and how does that then link right. with the core of the medical district along the Alabama corridor and then also link into the to the, the rest of downtown and and those are those linkages are incredibly important and right. and also begin to help give us the momentum to close the gap between uh, st. Jude and Le Bonner and the core of the medical yeah. district okay bill um, will the organization that you're involved with it at so at some point Ride herd, for lack of a better term, over a TIF or or s some kind of financing district. Um, well, we haven't gotten into that yet. I mean, th that, that's uh, that, that's not something that we we're, we're digging into right now. Uh, we certainly are not cut out to be a, a group that would be administering any sort of tax incentives. It's not. We don't have that type of a relationship. We're not that type of an organization. So to that end, uh, you know, I don't know that, that that's our, our involvement. Um, of course, we would love to see some type of incentives offered within the district, especially as it, as it would promote quality, affordable housing uh, in, in, in the mm. district, but, um, but not something that, uh, that we would be running. You know, what I will say, though, Bill, is that every day I get calls from the private sector, mm -hmm. as, as I'm sure Tommy and Gary do, too. You know, the private sector has been remarkably responsive to, the, to this effort, you know, and so there are developers knocking on the door every day that are expressing interest in developing these properties, and I would imagine along the financing and tax incentive line that there are organizations that will be coming out of the woodwork in support of this effort. And to your question about the pinch district, any vibrancy mm -hmm. from, from wherever, we see it as a positive. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Just a couple of this will be successful X years down the road, if what happens? If you, you look back, you know, five years and, and 
What, what do you want to see differently? Well, if we've improved the image of the medical center, uh, that would be some, something equal to what we see at Overton uh, Square. Um, and if we have, uh, I don't know what percentage to draw out, but a percentage of my employee population now living in the medical district and biking to work and going to restaurants and shopping in the medical district, that's success to, to me. Yeah, same question to you. That billion dollar economic impact that our faculty and students have, I'd like the, the concentration of it to be in the medical district in terms of living, restaurants, shopping, having those amenities, you know, improve the local transportation so that they can move from the medical district to Overton Square to downtown, you know, we should have a robust public transportation system. Yeah. Uh, and when people look at moving to cities and, and living in communities, those are the things that they look for. Yeah, 15 seconds. Thoughts? I'm sure you agree with those two things. Anything right. else you would add that you would look back five years, you know, and say, I'm glad we got that part done? Yeah, I, well, I, one thing I would say is that I, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Yeah. And uh, 20 years on, and West Philly, there's still work to do. And while we're going to start seeing changes okay. very soon, it's going to be a, a long process. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night. Support for Behind the Headlines is provided in part by the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and its member company, Ewing Kessler Incorporated, providing mechanical and building control solutions for sustainable, energy-efficient building performance. This privately owned regional company is committed to relationships and service responsive to clients' needs. Learn more at ewingkessler.com and ekautomation.com.